I'm going to start out with a little story today. It's called The Mystic and the Scientist. One day, a religious man approached a mystic and asked, does God exist? Allow me to go within for an answer, the mystic replied. After meditating for quite some time, expanding her heart consciousness to embrace the totality of existence, she answered, I do not know what you mean by the word God, but I do know that this world is more mysterious and more wonderful than I could ever imagine. I know that you and I are part of something so much larger than our own lives. Perhaps this something larger is what you seek. Then the religious man approached a scientist. Does God exist? He asked. Let me think the scientist replied. And so she thought. She thought about the vastness of the universe, 156 billion light years, or something like 936 tr billion trillion miles in diameter, and the almost immeasurable smallness of a quark. She thought of how the energy of the Big Bang fuels the beating of her own heart. And then she answered, I do not know what you mean by the word God, but I do know that this world is more mysterious and more wonderful than I could ever imagine. I know that you and I are part of something so much larger than our own lives. Perhaps this something larger is what you seek. The religious man then thought to himself, he thought of what he knows and what he does not know. He thought about how he knows what he knows and how he knows he doesn't know what he doesn't know. <laughs> he thought about his experience of the world and how it is but one tiny infinitesimal fraction of all experience. He thought about his dependence on forces larger than himself and he thought about the interdependence of all existence. He experienced wonder and he pondered mystery. And then he knew. He knew in his soul the truth of what the mystic and the scientist said, that he is part of something so much larger than his own life. And then, and only then, did he think about what he would call it. So today I'll be speaking about the first source of Unitarian Universalism. And as you may know, in addition to our seven principles, which are our ethical value statements, we have something called six sources. Now, we don't rival the, Buddha, the Buddhists in terms of numerical lists. Uh, Kirk told us last week that there are just too many lists in Buddhism. We can't compete, but we do have at least two lists I can think of. And our six sources of Unitarian Universalism represent what I call the spiritual buffet from which we get to uh, serve, our, <laughs> serve, our, serve, from our, serve onto our plate. Um, it is all of the uh, spiritual ideas, all of the sources of wisdom that we are more than welcome to incorporate into our own personal theology to determine our own sense of purpose and meaning. So today's, I'm talking about the first source, which I think it's pretty remarkable that this source ended up being the first on the list. I have no idea how when they put the sources together how they decided to order them. But I think this is cool because our first source is direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. So number one on our source list is direct experience. That puts a, puts a lot of trust in us as individuals, right? That we're looking to ourselves as sources of information about truth and life. I think that's pretty remarkable to, a thing to have in a religion. You know, we, uh, Rosie talked about Charles Darwin, how he used his own direct experience, his experience of observation, through observation of nature, to come up with a theory of evolution. That is uh, a very remarkable thing. And I think it's worthy of being part of a religion. Um, but then there's also um, language in this first source that really lends us to something other than the scientific observation side. It lends us to the mystical, transcendent side. So it's, this first source is offering us you know, brainy Unitarian Universalists who really like our science and information is saying, hey, y'all, because you know, Unitarian Universalism is inherently Southern, 
It's not really. But it's saying, hey, y'all, no matter how scientific you are, you've had those moments, those experiences of mystery and wonder, and this, these feelings of connection. And even though we love our science and we're brainiacs, we have permission to feel those moments. And maybe we should try to feel those moments more often. And it doesn't mean that you are a, a woo-woo, kind of crazy, out there kind of person, right? Um, so that's, that's my nutshell of what, what I like about the first source. And that was also demonstrated, I think, really well in the story of the scientist and the mystic. Because you think of those things as being polar opposites, right? They would have different answers to every single question, but you ask them about God, and they come up with the exact same answers. They are just two methods, two methods of arriving at the same conclusion. And it's all about, in that story, it's all about the something larger. And it doesn't necessarily matter what you call that something larger. And that's one of the things I really love about our UU faith tradition. It doesn't matter if we're theists or agnostics or atheists. We're generally interested in connecting with something larger, whether that something larger is described as God or goddess or as the interdependent web of all existence, or if it's described as the universe or just simply the mystery or maybe just the human family. Our something largers may not be exactly the same, but we can come together every week and hold in reverence these larger somethings. And maybe someday we might want to, you know, contemplate a different something larger or a different way of looking at it that may be new to us. This whole idea of this something larger, it's one of the reasons why I like to refer to our Sunday gatherings as worship services. This word can be a little tweaky. We've got these tweaky words in Unitarian Universalism, words that sound way too religious. But I like to stick with the old school worship um, because the root word of worship is worth, worthship, meaning that we gather to consider what is of significant and ultimate worth. We're here to celebrate the things that are most important, the most worthy to all of us. And again, that might be a little different for each person here, but I think we can still celebrate it together. So when we're invited into worship, it's this, it denotes a special time. This isn't an ordinary time. It's a time we actually set aside, time from our daily lives, to contemplate and celebrate and revere, hold in reverence. Maybe if we're lucky, we'll get a little awe in there as well. But it's when we come together to celebrate something larger than our individual selves, <clears throat> whatever that something larger may be. And I think that exercise of, in and of itself is quite worthy because, you know, we human beings, you know how self-involved we tend to get and how we kind of forget about the greater whole, how we lose the forest for the trees in our everyday lives, you know, with our problems that seem so over overwhelming <clears throat> and all-encompassing, and then it takes a certain experience of transcendence to go, oh, I sh maybe I shouldn't sweat that small stuff so much because I am just a little dot in this vast, amazing creation. So we can have worship, and we can recognize that myst mysticism doesn't have to conflict with science. Um, I love that Albert Einstein, he was an unapologetic mystic. He said, the most beautiful and profound emotion we can experience is the sensation of the mystical. It is the sower of all true science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. Okay, Einstein says so. So there's a scholar who wrote a classic paper um, back in 1990. His name is David Steindl Rast. And his paper was called The Mystical Core of Organized Religion. And in it, he provides a working definition of mysticism. He says, mysticism has been democratized in our day. No, not so long ago, real mystics, with air quotes, were those who had visions, levitations, and bilocations, and most important, were those who had lived in the past. Any contemporary mystic was surely a fake. But he continues, today we realize that extraordinary mystical phenomena have little to do with the essence of mysticism. 
Of course, the genuine mystics had told us all along, we just wouldn't listen. We've come to understand mysticism as the experience of communion with ultimate reality. For example, communion with God, if you feel comfortable with this time-honored, but also time-distorted term. Okay, he's still talking here. Um, many of us experience a sense of communion with ultimate reality once in a while. In our best, most alive moments, we feel somehow one with that fundamental whatever it is that keeps us all going. Even psychological research suggests that the experience of communion with ultimate reality is nearly universal among humans. So we find ourselves officially recognized as bona fide mystics. So I think he's saying here, it doesn't matter. We're all mystics. We've all had those experiences. So let's not get too worked up, up about it. Um, he continues, some of us even sense the challenge to translate the bliss of universal communion into the nitty gritty of human community in daily living. That's the end quote, right? trying to bring that mystical into regular life, everyday life. Now, our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition has a long history of mysticism on both sides. Um, Coming to mind pretty easily are the Unitarian Transcendentalists, right? They were a mystical movement within Unitarianism. And there are plenty of UU myst mystics uh, in the present day in great numbers. Um, and, um, and I don't think it's any accident that Don Weiner is here today. Because <laughs> um, he is a member of an online community of UU mystics on face on online and on Facebook. Um, their website is uumystics.org, not hard uh, to remember. Um, and this group, they say that mysticism is one of the most misunderstood concepts, often mistaken with esoteric and far out spiritual paths. That's the woo woo stuff I referred to earlier. Some believe mysticism is the opposite of rationalism or that mystics are isolated beings disconnected from reality. But yet they say mysticism is quite the opposite. It's communion with Right? It's communion with rather than a disconnect from ultimate reality. It's about getting to ultimate reality. It's not checking out into some spacey place. Again, they, they say, they say this in, in genuine print, they say mysticism isn't necessarily some woo-woo escape into a past life or an out-of-body experience. I wonder if woo-woo is in the dictionary. It's, it's, very, it's very useful and graphic, I think, in its terminology. Um, but the aim of mysticism is to connect us to that something larger. The unity, the oneness, that same feeling that encourages people to pray or to meditate, along with many, many spiritual practices I can't even mention, that help us find this special, often kind of not very long-lasting feeling with so many names. You know, you can call that feeling enlightenment, you can call it peace, you can call it oneness, you can call it higher consciousness. There's uh, one Unitarian Universalist named Sam Berliner. Um, he says that mysticism is quite simply the frank acknowledgement that there is far more to existence than we know and can ever know. So again, within this frame, just about anyone can be a mystic or have a mystical experience. Now, for me personally, I, I find little breakthrough moments of peace, breakthrough feelings of connectedness and oneness, you know, sometimes, uh, on the yoga mat, sometimes through meditation. Now that's as exciting and out there as it gets for me when it comes to mystical experiences. And I'm very appreciative of those moments. They feel good, they help put everything into perspective. And my problems seem small and trivial when I feel like I am part of this larger, much bigger thing. Of course, for me, those feelings are very fleeting, and I wish I could keep that higher consciousness perspective all the time, but like many, I am very much still a work in progress. But even though I haven't had any really dramatic mystical experiences, I mean, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. More people than you think have had the more dramatic ones, and I'm talking about some of the sanest and most reliable and together people I have met Many of them have had more dramatic mystical experiences. They just don't feel safe talking about them with everyone. Um, Meg Barnhouse, the senior minister at our congregation in UU Austin, and unfortunately she's retiring in June, um, she has this cool way of dealing with disbelief in mystical experiences. 
She tells her, her church people, she says, so many people have these mystical experiences, it is unscientific to ignore them. Go Meg. So here's more evidence of mysticism and Unitarian Universalism. Uh, one of our UU ministers wrote, um, just you know, anecdotally, I think it might have been a social media post to other ministers. Um, back in the fall, I was asked, he said, I was asked to give a lecture to kick off the adult RE programming for the year. My, my lecture was about mystical experiences. He continues, last night, after numerous requests, requests, they were asking him to do this, I facilitated a group discussion about mystical experiences. The room was packed with people who came to share their secret stories. These are you use, by the way, just let me say. People shared their out-of-body experiences, soul travel, encounters with spirits and ghosts, premonitory dreams, automatic writing, telekinesis, conversations with the dead, trances, altered states, and more. Sharing was intimate and vulnerable and was met with acceptance and appreciation. I am convinced that these types of conversations are important. I love them. That's the end quote. So it appears um, that many of us have had these more dramatic experiences, um, but we'll never hear about them unless we create safe spaces to talk about them. Yet, most religions, you know, are not really much better in supporting mysticism um, and the individuality of it. You know, a mystical experience is a very individual thing, and religion. Um, isn't always very supportive of that. All sorts of religions aren't always very supportive of that. Um, religious mystics are sometimes shunted off into whole other religious branches. Uh, for example, the mystic branch of Islam is Sufism, um, and Judaism has the mystic branch of Kabbalah. And Christian uh, mysticism, especially in the kind of alt-Catholic realm, is very, very prevalent. Some argue, some historians argue that all religions arose actually out of human mystical experience. We're having these experiences, let's make a religion out of them. Um, our, um, our writer I referenced earlier, scholar David Steindl Rust, he, he thinks that's true. He thinks all religious doctrine can be traced to its roots in mystical experience and that every religion, in every religion there is a tension between the mystical and the religious establishment. He says, as a new mystic religion gets organized and becomes institutionalized, the mysticism is progressively lost. The beauty, awe, and mystery of something larger is superseded by the ultimate truth of doctrine. And personal, direct experience is sacrificed to the gods of religious law and conformity. So there's another UU minister, the Reverend Dr. David Breeden, he has a different, very different take on mystical experiences. Um, much more the scientist, I would say. He sees mystical experiences as a function of brain chemistry, but yet he values these experiences just as much. He's not debunking, he just you know, says it, it's, it comes from a different source, but he still really likes them. Um, he says, spirituality is emotion. Sometimes the spiritual emotion springs from a consciously adopted attitude toward the world we see around us. Sometimes it hits us unexpectedly. A spiritual experience can be anything from the warm, fuzzy feeling we get singing a song we love to the inexpressible, mystical experience of feeling one with all that is. He says both are great feelings, but they're not mysterious. As we learn more about brain science, we see more clearly what techniques and technologies best trigger certain responses. For example, when the rhythm of music reaches about 120 beats per minute, the average heart rate, which is the average heart rate for mild exertion, we feel like dancing. For Breeden, mystical experience is about being in the moment. He continues listening without preconception, without judgment, without the interference of ego, listening in order to hear, to experience right now with as little of the usual, of the usual interference as possible. He calls that unmediated experience. It requires us to be in the place of the breath and that mental space that is at once maximum concentration and maximum surrender. And he goes on to say that this experience may be achieved by various techniques from meditation to fasting to merely looking up at the stars. 
From the centering prayer of Christianity to Buddhist Zazen to the various yogas, human beings have developed actual techniques for getting into this space, this brain chemistry space of mystical experience Breeden is talking about. Mysticism is a technique aimed at achieving a mystical experience. Again, this experience is a feature of brain function and has little to do with specific religious or philosophical practices, except that all religions aim for the experiences and have techniques for achieving it. Every religion has a means of getting there to that type of experience. Since mystical experiences are a feature of brain chemistry, not specific religions, atheists and agnostics have no particular reason to poo-poo the idea. Mystical experience doesn't need a religious component at all as was demonstrated by the work of a psychologist who introduced the notion of flow experience. He found flow in experiences as diverse as video, as, as sports and video gaming. And I'm going to talk about flow experiences, but I just want to back up because he basically said you don't really need religion to have a mystical experience. I don't think he was saying you shouldn't come to church or be part of a church community because church just offers more. You know, they, they offer like community and sharing and love and support. So, you know, um, you can have your mystical experiences on your own at home and still come to church too. All right, now that I've added that, a really important disclaimer um, because it was a UU minister who said this, so he's not anti-church um, if he wants to stay employed, that is. But um, so flow experiences as mystical experiences, I think is a really interesting idea. We talked about flow when we did the series on the happiness course, but um, like you can often think of something you know you did that's all absorbing. Like I'm gonna ask the musicians, wake, wake up guys, have you had a time <laughs> when you're noodling around on your instrument and all of a sudden like hours have gone by and you were somewhere else? I knew Christian would say yes. I totally, Christian's like, a t uh, and Rob is saying yes. Arthur, he's like, yeah, okay, I'll admit, yeah. But, these flow experiences are like mis mystical experiences, and they're characterized by intense and focused concentration in the moment. Um, you're merging your action and awareness together. Your mind is totally absorbed in what you're doing. Um, you're not being self-reflective or self-consciousness. You're not worried about me, 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 me at all. That disappears. Um, you do have a sense of personal control or agency over the situation or activity. Um, and again, you get a feeling of time distortion, right? The hours fly by, and you experience this activity as intrinsically rewarding. So it's something you really love to do. Um, a lot of times it's music, it's art, forms of art, uh, it's crafting, any other, I'm sure there are many other examples out there. But again, um, there's a lot in common between an experience of flow and a mystical experience. They have a lot of the same characteristics. So there's really nothing that mysterious about mystical experience if you break it down and take advantage of the knowledge that's out there. You can put yourself in the way of a flow experience by doing some really secular and simple things. Spirituality is a feeling. We don't have to buy what particular religions are selling to access these feelings. It's all in our heads. And those are the last of our words from David Breeden. So a lot of our spiritual practices can be done alone, but there is something to be said, like I mentioned earlier in my disclaimer, that there's, there's, there's a use for contemplating things of ultimate worth in supportive community, where we can learn from each other and provide some encouragement on our mutual and indi individual life journeys. Breeden's emphasis is that mystical experience doesn't come from our religions, really. They don't come from out there. They come from in here. So, um, the late Swami Satchidananda, he was the founder of Yogaville in Virginia, the ashram. And his famous saying is, many paths, one truth. Unitarian Universalism has a similar saying from the late Reverend Forrest Church. He says, many windows, one light. We have the freedom here. We have the variety offered us here to choose many, many different paths to truth. And those many diverse paths, they often lead to the same place. And that's perfectly OK. We may call this same place different things. We might call them oneness, enlightenment, peace, self-actualization, wisdom, or ultimate reality. But the end, it's all pretty much the same. It's about something larger than ourselves. 
So I hope today's service has broadened your thinking about mysticism, whether you consider yourself a mystic or even if that idea makes you a little uncomfortable. It's important that we acknowledge that we even celebrate our mystical sides, that urge inside us to find oneness, to find wholeness, to find unity, to feel connection, to feel wonder and awe just by the very idea that we exist. It helps us appreciate life. It helps us live in the moment. So every religion, Unitarian Universalism included, has its mystical core. But the challenge is really to access it and live into the power of this core. Amen and blessed be.